this decade, the 2010s will be remembered as the decade of 50-year anniversaries of stuff that happened in the 60s. In fact, I'm going to tweet that. <laughs> the Apollo Project. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, we're explorers. We're discoverers. What about the Kennedy speech? He says, we will do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. He had charisma, and we're explorers. You know that speech? In the joint session of Congress, where he says, we'll put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. You know that speech? Go three paragraphs earlier in that speech. That speech was given six weeks after Yuri Gagarin came out of orbit. We didn't yet have a vehicle that wouldn't kill one of our astronauts for having going up in it. And Kennedy saying, we're going to go to the moon before the decade is out. Three paragraphs earlier, what does he say? He says, if the events of recent weeks are any... In Gagarin had come out of orbit. If the events of recent weeks are any indication of the minds of men everywhere, of the impact of this adventure, then we need to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. It was a battle cry against communism. The rest was fluff. War... I don't want to die, driver, money, driver. That's what it is. So, without the politics, nothing happens. I have, I don't like it, but I accept it and understand it. In fact, over that period, we lost practically every measure of scientific, of, of space achievement in a head-to-head -head contest with the Soviet Union. We would finally go to the moon and we say, we win. Okay, that we declare ourselves winners. But anyone who kept a scorecard along the way would show that we lost practically every other metric. The Russians had the first satellite, the first non-human animal, the first human, the first woman, the first black person, or someone from Cuba, the first space station, the longest time logged in space. The, they had the first um, uh, landers on Venus, the first landers on the moon. They had a rover on the moon while our astronauts were there. We were reactive to the Soviet Union, not proactive. Yet we remember ourselves as leaders. We, as a culture, have never fully embraced science as a culture. It's never really there. And we might be surprised how well we had done in the 20th century with our science. Oh, I know why. In the 20th century, multiple times we felt threatened, militaristically threatened. And so we started funding physicists. Physicists are experts in matter, motion, and energy. And the military are experts in moving energy from here to over there. This makes <laughs> physicists really valuable to the military. And so, most of our scientific advances of the 20th century have come about because we felt threatened. It was the I don't want to die driver to fund this. So I want to talk about innovation and culture. Space as culture. Let's check it out. All right, let's go back to the Second World War. Werner von Braun <coughs> works for the German army, the Nazis, essentially, and he wants to terrorize London, but he can't get to London to terrorize it. He wants, has to do it from afar. He's a rocket pioneer. So he invents the first intercontinental ballistic missile, and it is the V-2 rocket. V-2 rocket. You know what this rocket looks like. It is bullet-shaped. It has fins, four huge fins, coming out left and right and front and back. That rocket was powerful enough to leave our atmosphere, travel through the vacuum of space, fall out of the sky, and land on a target. The V-2 rocket. Everyone knew, apart from this military application of that rocket, that no one had ever sent anything out of the atmosphere before. So if there was ever going to be a future in space, that... Sorry. That was the ticket. 
after the war, people were started to think creatively. How do we use this new rocket technology to go into orbit? The V-2 rocket was a sign of future dreams, holding aside the military application of it. Future dreams. So what happens? In the 1950s, all science fiction stories that had rockets to space, those rockets look like the V-2. Babar goes to the moon, his rocket ship had fins. <laughs> Tintin goes to the moon, his rocket ship had fins. Old episodes of the Twilight Zone. Whenever they had a spaceship, they had fins. People were thinking about the future. Who here is old enough to remember the 1950s when cars had fins? <laughs> it influenced car design. You might have gone up to those car designers and said, well, where did, where did these fins come from? Oh, it just looks cool. They might not even be aware of the cultural force of what it is to dream about out there. Because when something operates as a culture, you're not even conscious of it. You just do it. You're not even thinking about it. I'll give you an example of culture operating. My first time I ever visited Italy, I go into a grocery store. And I, and I walk by and I say, what is this? There's an entire aisle of pasta. And I thought, we, know, we don't have whole aisles of pasta. This is Italy. They invented pasta. So of course, they're going to have the most pasta of any place in the world. So they got fusilli number two. They've got pasta shapes and squiggles we never see or hear of. Now, I asked an Italian friend, do you notice that you have an entire aisle of pasta? No, no, it's just the pasta aisle. <laughs> they didn't even notice it. So then I asked the, that by, I, I repeated this in China. I went into a, 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 a grocery store, whole aisle of rice. Every kind of rice, long grain, medium grain, short grain, high gluten, low gluten. But, uh, Thai rice, Chinese rice, uh, um, Vietnamese, uh, brown rice. It would go on and on and on. I asked someone from China, do you know you have a whole aisle of rice? And that's just the rice aisle. So then I said, is there any version of that back here in America? Because maybe I don't notice it. They said, of course. It's obvious to a foreigner. We have the soft drink aisle. Okay, we kind of pioneered the marketing of soft drinks. The entire aisle, floor to ceiling, left and right, is soft drinks. Nobody else in the world has a soft drink aisle. It's a part of an aisle that's got other stuff in it. I said, anything else? Yes. The ready-to-eat breakfast cereal aisle. <laughs> that's just the cereal aisle to us. You don't stop and look at it and contemplate it. These are, these are sort of low levels of examples of what it means when something is your culture. When it's your culture, you cease to notice it. That's a good thing. I'm not complaining. I'm just asserting that we have fins going into space and our cars have fins. And it's easy to think that that's just cool. That is this V2 rocket operating on the creativity of car design. So what happens? Kennedy gives a speech, 1961, May 25th. We're coming up on the 50th anniversary of this speech, joint session of Congress. He says, we're going to the moon. We're going to the moon. And by the way, this guy who invented the V-2 rocket, we didn't take him to Nuremberg. No, he was not hanged for war crimes. No, we snatched him, put him in Huntsville, Alabama. That would have been a shock, I think, for a German. Uh, <laughs> that, that one, Huntsville, Alabama, he was tasked with creating America's future in space. And he designed this three-stage Saturn V rocket. The Saturn V rocket, 32 stories tall. It has fins, but they're not big fins. 
They're little fins. They did some aerodynamics and they figured out little fins are just fine. Right around the early 60s, 1962, 63, 64, the fins went away on the cars. The fins went away. Oh, it ran its course. No, the spaceships didn't have fins anymore. All right. Consider the following. Consider. The 1960s was the bloodiest decade in American history since the Civil War. There was a Cold War. There was a hot war in Southeast Asia. There was campus unrest. Buildings even here were blowing up from student protests of our presence in Southeast Asia. There were assassinations. There was the Tet Offensive in February 2000, uh, 1968. That entire uh, civil rights movement was playing out weekly. The conflict and the unrest. In that decade, we were going to the moon. Okay? What happens in 1964? The New York World's Fair. If anything was about thinking about tomorrow, it was the World's Fair. Everything was about tomorrow. A, t a tomorrow that technology and science would bring you. Again, this is the bloodiest decade in American history. The most turbulent in American history since the Civil War. And we've got people thinking about tomorrow. The Unisphere, that's the sphere Earth. It had three rings around it. If you ask the designers, they said, oh, we just thought the three rings looked cool. Excuse me? America's first astronaut went around Earth how many times? Three times. John Glenn made three orbits around the Earth. That Earth isn't just sitting there as an Earth. It's got three rings around it. Tipped around near the equator. Let's keep going forward. We have the Mercury program, the Gemini program. Who here got a little misty-eyed during the last shuttle mission? Raise your hand if you got a little misty-eyed. A little misty-eyed. Okay. Um, that's not why you were getting misty-eyed. You think you were misty-eyed because it was the last shuttle mission. No. You don't even understand your own emotions. <laughs> you were misty-eyed because... There was not another spaceship on an adjacent launch pad to continue that epic adventure. That's why you were misty eyed. <laughs> Nobody shed a tear at the end of the Gemini mission because the mighty Saturn V was sitting right next door, ready to go to the moon. Gemini, oh, isn't that quaint? Let's dust it all, put it in a museum, but let's get on with the exploration. That's why you were shedding a tear. None of this nostalgia for stuff that came before. When you have nostalgia, the people who have nostalgia for stuff that came before, it's because nothing is following it. That's when you have nostalgia. That's what drives nostalgia. There's nothing to keep you going. So you gotta turn backwards. In fact, if we're not careful, this decade, the 2010s will be remembered as the decade of 50-year anniversaries of stuff that happened in the 60s. In fact, I'm going to tweet that. Give me a second. Okay. Where was I before I twitterupted myself? Uh, <laughs> fifth, thank you, 50th anniversary of stuff that happened in the 50s. So, so by the way, these dreams of tomorrow, I know most of you like are like still in school. Who's here? Any old folks here? Just raise your hand if you're some old folks. Some old folks. Old folks remember. Ma'am, you are not that old. The gentleman behind you, raise your hand, please. <laughs> yes, you're not old. There you go. All the ones with the gray hair will remember in that period, you didn't have to go more than a week or two before an article came out in Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Look Magazine, that talked about the city of tomorrow. 
the home of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow, food of tomorrow. Tomorrow was a fundamental presence in the culture. And if you wanted to make that tomorrow happen, you knew you needed to understand science and technology to get there. It was built in. So now let's, let, let, let's see what else goes on in that decade. 1968 comes around. The bloodiest year in the bloodiest decade. Martin Luther King is shot. RFK is shot. As I said earlier, that was the Tet Offensive. Apollo 8 is launched. December 1968. Apollo 8, an un, a forgotten mission. People don't think about Apollo 8. We all remember Apollo 11 with Neil Armstrong. Apollo 8, it was the first time anybody ever left Earth with another world as the destination. They did not plan to land. That would happen later. They're testing the rocket, the translunar injection, which is what it's called. When they light that tertiary rocket and it gets them out of Earth orbit and they're headed for the moon. Apollo 8 went to the moon, went into orbit around the moon. Here was this mission to go to the moon to see what the moon is about. And as they orbit the backside of the moon, they lift up their Hasselblad camera, and what rises over the, hor the, the horizon? Earth. Earth. That picture is snapped. It is the most recognized photo of anything that has ever been photographed in the history of the world. Earth rise over the moon. Earth, seen not as cartographers would have drawn it, with continents color and countries color coded to distinguish one municipality from another. No, it is not as map makers would have us see the earth. It is as nature intended. Ocean, land, air. Beginning in 1968, the following unfolded. The Whole Earth Catalog gets published. Whole Earth? Where do you even get that term from? Who's thinking Whole Earth? Is that phrase even have currency until we went to the moon? Because what we noticed was that the act of going to the moon allowed us to discover Earth for the first time. Back up the moon landing was 1969, of course. We go to the moon between 1968 and 1972. We are going to the moon. We are still at war in Vietnam. A hundred servicemen dying per week. We are still at war. The Environmental Protection Agency, founded in 1970. There's a movie called The Hellstrom Chronicle. It was, a, it, was a, it was a pseudo documentary alerting us of the dangers of going out of balance with the environment and how insects are, are rather well equipped to replace us in the future if we don't behave. The organization Doctors Without Borders was founded in 1971. Where do you even come up with that phrase, without borders? Who's thinking that? without borders. If you asked them, they probably would have told you, oh, it just sounded like a good idea, because we want to cross over for, then no one would have even had that phrase at the tip of their tongue without that photo of Earth rising in front of the moon. The Comprehensive Endangered Species Act, December 1973. The first catalytic converter for cars, 1973. The first unleaded emission standards for cars, 1973. In a period of five years, the nation transformed from one who's fighting wars and choosing boundaries and, and, and to one that actually cared about the earth. <clears throat> Can you put a price tag on that? People say, why are we going in space? we got problems down here. You don't even know how to think about some of those problems down here until you got into space and looked back at what we looked like from the dark void of the cosmos.
That is culture operating on our ideas, on our dreams, on our creativity. That, that's what I'm talking about. All right, so 1973, we stopped going to the moon. All those articles end. People aren't thinking about tomorrow anymore. It's just not there. Every now and then, maybe, but it wasn't part of our culture. The World's Fair of the 1970s wasn't really about tomorrow. It was, but it was like, well, we have to be a little more energy conservative. Okay, so it was this failure of people's dreams. The 1970s World's Fair. It, was, it, was, it missed the point of what a World's Fair meant. It was not issued forth in a culture that viewed tomorrow as something that was in our reach. Because when you go into the moon, that is a really tomorrow thought. It influenced movie production. It influenced television production. It influenced novels. It's influencing not only the educational pipeline and students who want to become in, and enter the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, math, it influenced everybody else. Journalists did stories about space. Artists were influenced about space. Poets were influenced by this magic, this majestic vista that we had upon Earth. You look at the number of TV shows influenced by these things. Star Trek, perhaps the most successful science fiction story ever in all of its incarnations, was birthed in that era. By the mid-1970s, that all ended. All right? It's not only culture, it's economics. We're entering the 21st century. If you are not fluent as a culture in science, technology, engineering, and math, you will fade so fast, you might as well just march back into the cave right now, because that's where we're all going to end up if we don't embrace the fact that innovations in science and technology are the engines of tomorrow's economy. I'm not making this up. Developed nations have known this since the Industrial Revolution. They've known this. Anyone who has embraced innovations in science and technology has led the world. Led the world in every way that mattered to a nation that advances. Something else you can do. On what level did this influence it? Our economy has grown consistently since the 1960s. But you can ask the question a different way. How much has it grown between the beginning of a decade and, an end, and the end of a decade as a percent? The highest percent growth in the last 50 years was between 1960 and 1970. In that 10-year period, the economy grew at a higher rate than at any decade that followed. You know the second highest decade? Second to that decade? The 1970s. The third decade? The 1980s. Fourth? The 1990s. Fifth? The 2000s. Sixth, now. Now, have you looked at your how much interest you're getting on your savings account? <laughs> have you done? You didn't think decimals could get that low, did you? <laughs> what is it? Point oh oh one percent? Is that the right number? Zeros? Someone help me here. How, how much? What's the percent? What are we getting? Point oh one five. I want that amount because I ain't getting. That. <laughs> He's got point oh one five. Our economy has flatlined as our distance has increased, time distance has increased from that era. Some years ago, I did a study. I wanted to go to Mars. I wanted to send people to Mars. And I said, well, this would be really expensive. Would anyone agree to do it? I thought. It might be a challenge. So I said, let me just look at the history of all the expensive stuff people did in the past. All right? Then I look at what drove them to do it. I look it up on the table. Find, hey, I say, hey, we could do that as Americans in the 20th. So let me do that. So I was going to make a whole set of tables 
on the drivers that compelled nations and cultures to do expensive things. Expensive financially or in terms of human capital as well. I came up with only three drivers. Three. First, let's agree what's on the list. The pyramids. Uh, the cathedrals of uh, churches of Europe. I'll take that as an activity. That was very expensive. Um, the Great Wall of China. The Manhattan Project that built the atomic bomb. The Apollo Project. The, what else, the Columbus Voyages, major investments of a culture. We'd all agree they're expensive. Well, what was I talking about? <laughs> Three things, thank you. Somebody, front row is paying attention here, thank you. Three things. Three. Number one of them all, it's obvious. It's the I don't want to die driver. The war driver. That's what gives you the Great Wall of China. That's what gives you the Manhattan Project. That's what gave us the Apollo Project. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, we're explorers. We're discoverers. What about the Kennedy speech? He says we will do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. He had charisma, and we're explorers. You know that speech in the joint session of Congress where he says we'll put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth? You know that speech? Go three paragraphs earlier in that speech. That speech was given six weeks after Yuri Gagarin came out of orbit. We didn't yet have a vehicle that wouldn't kill one of our astronauts for having going up in it. And Kennedy saying, we're going to go to the moon before the decade is out. Three paragraphs earlier, what does he say? He says, if the events of recent weeks are any... In Gagarin had come out of orbit. If the events of recent weeks are any indication of the minds of men everywhere, of the impact of this adventure, then we need to show the world the path of freedom over the path of tyranny. It was a battle cry against communism. The rest was fluff. <laughs> you go to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, there's a bust of Kennedy there. Of course there would be. And there's a granite wall behind it and chiseled into that granite. He says, we will put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth. And I'm thinking, well, how about the rest of that speech? How about the, the, the kill the commies part of that speech? <laughs> plenty of room on this wall. Kill the commies, go to the moon. They left that out. They left that out. They cleansed our memory of that period and of ourselves. The real driver was war. The space enthusiasts were delusional about this. We're going to the moon. That's great. We keep this up. By the 1980s, we'll be on Mars. Yeah. That's if Discovery were driving the, the check writing. Yeah, we'd be on Mars by the 1980s. But we were at war with the Soviet Union, and they said they were going to put someone on the moon, and that would have been the new high ground, and we were going to have none of it. So we put a man on the moon, found out they're not going to the moon. That's the end of the space program. Some people said, oh, you lost your political will. You lost your drive. No, we lost the enemy. This is different. In fact, over that period, we lost practically every measure of, scientific, of, of space achievement in a head-to-head -head contest with the Soviet Union. We would finally go to the moon and we say, we win. <laughs> okay. Then we declare ourselves winners. But anyone who kept a scorecard along the way would show that we lost practically every other metric. The Russians had the first satellite, the first non-human animal, the first human, the first woman, the first black person, but someone from Cuba, the first space station, the longest time logged in space. The, they had the first... Um, uh, landers on Venus, the first landers on the moon. They had a rover on the moon while our astronauts were there. We were reactive to the Soviet Union, not proactive. Yet we remember ourselves as leaders. My only point of that is to say we were at war and the money flowed like rivers. And the moment the war threat ended, the money stopped. That's why we're not on Mars now. So I say to myself, if war is one of the drivers, is there any, although I don't want war to be a reason to go to Mars, 
I, 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 maybe others, I don't want that to be a reason. But you know we would do it if we felt threatened. And so I had a, I had a plot. I said, okay, I'm going to sneak over to China and, you know, just go into the office of the head guy and say, psst, leak a memo. Doesn't have to be true. Just leak a memo that says you want to put military bases on Mars. We'll be on Mars in 10 months. <laughs> It would be one month to fund, design, build, and launch the vehicle, and nine months to get there. Uh, if China wants to put, a, put somebody on Mars, they could do it. And it'd be easy, easy marketing thing, because like, Mars is already red, you know? So that would just work. That would just work. Easy. I don't want war to be the reason. So in this list, what else drove these major uh, efforts? The promise of economic return is a close second. That's what gave you the Columbus voyages, the Magellan voyages. That's what gave you the search for the Northwest Passage and all of these great voyages of discovery. No, they were voyages of economic return. We think of Columbus as a discoverer. He was a discoverer. Of course he was. But the Queen Isabella say, oh, Chris, when you come back, get, give, a, give us a PowerPoint presentation on the, on the botany that you found and, and illustrations of the natives. That Just talk, and tell that to the Academy. No. No, Queen Isabella said, here's a satchel of Spanish flags. Plant them wherever you land and declare the name, the land in the name of Spain. And while you're at it, find a shorter distance to the Far East and find out new ways for us to take control over the region. There were geopolitical reasons based in war and, it, well, in that case, hegemony, and the promise of economic return. That's how you get the Columbus voyage. Italy spent their money building churches. That's the third big driver. The praise of royalty and deity. That's how you get the pyramids. They're basically big tombstones for the pharaohs. What else do you get to? That gets you the cathedrals. It gets you all the vanity projects that were ex exercised by people in power. Okay. So there you have it. So I say to myself, how do you do this now? Can we go to Mars and justify it economically? Because I don't want to justify it militaristically. And I thought about it, I said, sure you can. Here's what you do. You go to NASA's budget and you double it. What? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Together now, what is its current budget on the tax dollar? Half a penny on the tax dollar. That's how much we all pay for the space station, formerly the shuttles, all of the, the NASA centers, 10 of them, the rovers, the Hubble telescope, the next generation telescope, one half of one penny on the tax dollar. Most, 100% of everybody I know who says, why are we spending money up there? And not there? I said, you know how much money we're spending up there? And they don't get the right answer. They think it's 5%, 10%, 20%. Then I tell them it's a half a penny on a dollar. They say, I didn't know that. I hadn't thought about it that way. Half a penny on a dollar. You know, I want to start a movement where federal agencies get paid a budget that people think they're getting. <laughs> In fact, the fact that people think NASA's budget is bigger than it is, there is no greater compliment to NASA, is there? Look at what they're doing with every dollar that they get. They, they make you think they're spending $20. That's how effective NASA is as a force operating on our culture. All right, so I want to take the half a penny and double it. If you do that, then, then you can build a whole suite of launch vehicles. And you can go wherever you want in the solar system. And we're going to need biologists because I'm looking for life on Mars. And maybe in the under ice oceans of Europa one of the moons of Jupiter, 
that's been kept warm by the gravitational stresses of jupiter and surrounding moons pumping energy into that moon, melting that ice, keeping in the liquid ocean for billions of years. every place on earth we have liquid water, we have life even the dead sea in fact it's called the dead sea because they didn't have microscopes when they named it okay? <laughs> It's a statement of their scientific ignorance, rather than on any insight into what's actually going on there. So you do this, and there's a call for biologists, chemists, geologists. We're looking at the, the, the rock formations on other planets. We need astrophysicists, physicists, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, aerospace engineers. The four aerospace engineering engineers. <laughs> So, so the, the call crosses the entire STEM spectrum. And if you do this, you're doing something different tomorrow than you did today. That is the foundation of discovery. I want to land on Mars in a particular way, a way I've never done before. I have to innovate, invent something new. Everything you do that's new in space is headline worthy the next day. It will be writ large. New way to make fuel from the buried waters in the frozen uh, uh, on the aquifers on Mars. There's water in the poles of moon. We take the water, split the hydrogen and the oxygen, make rocket fuel. If there's a new device that does that, this gets patented. This gets writ large on the daily newspapers. And th that operates like a force of nature on the educational pipeline. You don't need special programs under that umbrella. You don't need special programs to convince kids to be interested in science because the discoveries are coming at them left and right. You don't need special tariffs or tax, tax benefits so that companies keep their factories in America. If you agree that you're a global economy, it is the duty of a corporation to prop produce that product as cheaply as it can, and if it's got to take it to the Philippines to do it, it is expected that that's what they will do. But then we want to cry foul, as we've been doing lately. In the 1960s, no factories went overseas. You know why? Because we were innovating. And when you innovate, you make innovative products that no one else can make because they haven't figured out how to do it yet. That's how you keep your job. Right now, people go around putting up band-aids because I don't think they can think in higher in multi-connectivity. It, it's, oh, we need more science students. Let's make, it, make a better science teacher. Okay, there's a band-aid right there. You put the tariff for the factory. Oh, you want to innovate? There's some innovation industries. Let's throw some money their way. There, now we're done. Oh, no, 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 you don't get it. You don't get it. I'm sorry. That's almost like saying, we want people to think about tomorrow again. Let's have a new World's Fair where we think about tomorrow. No, you missed the point. The World's Fair of 1964 did not create the 1960s. Our missions to the moon created that World's Fair. It created the culture out of which that World's Fair rose. So make sure you know where the cart is and where the horse is when you're trying to solve these problems. So I submit to you that not only would a healthy space program bring you this force of nature, getting people interested in STEM fields, even if you're not a STEM interested person, you can't deny the value of science, technology, and engineering on what it is to make tomorrow come, on the value of your, your economy. And so it influences artists, journalists, attorneys. You might go into space law. There's a new company that just started uh, planetary resources. They want to mine asteroids. They're going to need lawyers for that. Okay? So then we have lawyers chasing asteroids instead of ambulances. That, what do you think of that? that how about that? Okay? So 
So when it is in your culture, it is in everybody's culture. The journalist starts doing more stories about space. The, the poets, as I said earlier, you, you start getting influenced even if you're not in the STEM fields, and you create an innovation nation. That's the nation that goes forward, that has a pumped economy because everybody sees the value of innovation. And you also may know there, there are sectors of our society that are kind of anti-science, okay? And, you know, the urge is, well, let's fight them. It's like, okay, but I, I, I don't have time for that. But you know what I do have time for? Making science writ large on the daily headlines. <coughs> that community, who are kind of anti-science, they existed in the 1960s. But they were left no place to stand because everybody knew that it was innovations in science and technology that had us lead the world in every metric that mattered over that period. And we were going to the moon. So you can't stand there and say, oh, I don't like science. I don't, science, I'll choose to not believe in science. <laughs> Forcing me to repeat what I said on Bill Maher a year ago. Good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. <laughs> and in that period, science, as I said, was writ large. You could you had no place to stand in denial of it. They just sent you back, you sent you back to your garage. Because you had no audience, you couldn't gain adherence, because everyone knew better. That's the way you fix that problem, not running after people, hitting them over the head. We tell ourselves this is a free society. People ought to be able to think however they want, vote however they want. But it ought to be an informed landscape. And if it's not, trouble follows. So. How do we fight politics? How do you fight politics? Yeah. How do we fight politics? Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing, I like that. I like that. By the way, I was going to give my, like, my very last line of this talk. I was like, warm enough for it. It was like, come, it was like right there. But I'll, I'll put a pause in this and I reply. Okay? Uh, as an academic, I, I, I'm an astrophysicist. That's what I do. I'm culturally, and I, I do other stuff too, obviously, but I am wired as an academic. I have academic values. In my culture, politics is a barrier between where you're standing and where you want to go. Every time. Every time. Okay? That's in academia. You move to Washington, D.C., politics is the currency. It is the thing. It is not a barrier. It is what it is. And so the most ineffective scientists out there are those who just bust into Washington and believe they can just put truth on the table and let it ride. No. It took me a while, but I, under I think I understand the politics now. And so let me find the forces that influence politics. And you know something? Spending big money on space. That's a political solution, not a scientific one, because science never drove space exploration. Neither did discovery, neither did the urge. It's in our DNA. Oh, we're Americans, so we're explorers. It is nature's. We must explore or we die. None of that has ever been revealed in the history of exploration. War, I don't want to die, driver. Money, I don't want to die, poor. Driver. That's what it is. So, without the politics, nothing happens. I have, I don't like it, but I accept it and understand it, and once you understand it, you can then navigate it. Without an understanding, you trip on it, and you fall on your elbow. <laughs> I'm going to read you my, my carefully composed final sentence here. <laughs> As goes the health of our space frontier, so too goes the economic, the emotional, and the cultural health 
of this nation. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. I mentioned planetary resources. What does that mean for the future of NASA and public and private uh, space exploration? Excellent question. First of all, planetary resources? No. Uh, this, this, so they want to go mine natural resources off of asteroids. Uh, if you bring an asteroid uh, maybe the size of this garden here that's metallic, it'll contain more platinum than has ever been mined in the history of the world. Same would go for iridium. It would almost be true for gold. Some asteroids have water. You would mine the water and hand it to NASA in space. Because otherwise NASA has to launch that water from Earth's surface into space. It costs $10,000 a pound to launch something into low Earth orbit. $50,000 a pound to get it to the moon's distance. If you can get water from an asteroid, hand it to NASA in space, charge them $30,000, NASA saves money, you make, you make $30,000. Okay, this could be the first project ever to turn billionaires into trillionaires. <laughs> now, uh, the guy who developed the Tesla, uh, Elon Musk, yeah. and he's also the CEO of SpaceX, he's famous for saying, want to make a small fortune in space? Start with a big fortune. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not obvious that this will turn a profit. It's not obvious. Somebody's got to do it, though because space has unlimited resources. Here we are killing each other because you happen to be living over a part of Earth's crust that has one resource and not another. If, if aliens came and landed here and I told them the stuff we were doing, I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> they say, well, how are you getting your energy? Well, we're pulling fossil fuels out of the ground. Will that run out one day? Yeah, that'll run out one day. Do you have a plan? No. <laughs> it will be gone. <laughs> Where are you getting your metals? Well, we're pulling them out of the crust, too. We have a whole asteroid. We're not, we got a space program, but we're not there yet. We don't. <laughs> If you have a whole suite of launch vehicles, you do science on Mars, you do tourist drones to the moon, you do mining on asteroids, you visit the Lagrangian point where all the forces balance, we can build huge structures there, you, you go check out Europa, look for life, and you might want to also check out an asteroid that could be headed our way. Maybe protecting human beings from extinction could work for you in terms of a funding plan, right? <laughs> Because you know that if the dinosaurs had a space program, they would have used it. <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's really funny. So dinosaurs went extinct. You know, an asteroid the size of Mount Everest 